you. Hi, I'm Lynn. I think I was maybe destined to become a designer. I'm going to show you a video of me as a three-year-old as proof. actually made this into a meme. I, I will always regret making this public, but I love it. Uh, so in my family, we kind of joke that this is why I became a designer, because I wanted to decide about the pictures. Um, and they were all Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That was the only thing I wanted to draw. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about my path since then to now, uh, being a, a so-called service design expert. Um, and I'm going to share with you a little bit. So. I'm going to do a sort of quick overview of what is service design. I'm going to talk about my path, and then I'm going to share some lessons learned as well. So how many people have heard of service design? How many of you are still a bit confused about what it is? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd start with uh, this sort of definition from Lou Down. Um, they are the director of design for the UK government. And Lou wrote this piece. She said she was really frustrated. And they said that service design is not any of these things. And I especially wanted to draw your attention to immune from capitalism. <laughs> Sometimes people think that service design is sort of very altruistic or kind of you know designed for social innovation. But unfortunately, it does operate within all the kind of same constraints that you deal with um, and is sort of not immune from capitalism. It's also not a new word for UX. And it can seem kind of simple or like a bit of a tautology, but it's actually just the design of services. So a couple of mindsets that are really important for service design. Uh, it's about thinking holistically across the whole journey someone goes through to get something done. So that happens over time and then also across lots of different channels. So not only the kind of digital pieces, but also the call center or the store or the retail experience. And that's part of what I really like. The scope sort of zooms out and looks a bit more holistically across the things people are doing. It's also about thinking from front to back of a service, so internal and external. So thinking about all the things that happen front stage that the user or customer actually sees, and then all of the things that happen backstage to make that possible. So all of the internal processes, what are the staff doing, what are the policies, and that's also kind of fun because you get to take this kind of um, double-edged lens in a way. And then this idea of being able to zoom in to specific moments or touch points of a service, as well as being able to zoom out and think about the whole service end to end in aggregate. Uh, so people are often curious about, like, what are the skills? Because there's a lot of overlap with digital product design, UX. And this is my list of what I look for if I'm you know, hiring or that I kind of think are really important in service design work. Um, and there's a couple I want to draw your attention to. So, Service prototyping means you got to get good at not just prototyping digitally, but also thinking about how do I prototype the interaction that happens in person? You know, how do we role play a call center interaction or a script? Um, how do we think about prototyping physical space? The other one that's really important is workshop design and facilitation. So often as a service designer, you're really facilitating a process with lots and lots of different people, lots and lots of different stakeholders. So you have to get really, really good at designing sessions that are going to kind of get you what you need, uh, as well as making people feel comfortable and kind of facilitating them through. So I thought I'd bring this to life and kind of share a UX project I've worked on and then contrast it a little bit with a service design one. Um, so this was the online account redesign for the public library. That's me with different hair. <laughs> it was a good few years ago. Um, but in this project, I was working with a visual designer, uh, with developers, and we were making the Toronto Public Library online account system responsive and trying to kind of make it more modern, mobile friendly. So, I was in charge of a lot of the typical things you're probably familiar with, information architecture, wireframing, usability testing. And the goal was really to design and launch this digital uh, experience. 
So in contrast, a service design project example uh, is redesigning the application process for a charitable fund. So a charitable fund came to us, uh, I was working at a company called Usability Matters at the time, and they said, we're having a lot of trouble with our application process. Um, it's not great for our clients, and it's also not great for our staff. And so this project was really about mapping that experience, is what you'll see all the you know, traditional post-its and all the rest, really thinking about what's happening backstage for the staff, as well as what are the clients going through, and then finding places we could intervene in that process and redesigning them. So there was actually no digital channels or touch points involved in this at all, and the main design work was redesigning the form and redesigning some of the back office processes that people were doing. So I think it's really important to note that it's not really about any one design discipline being better than the other. And often when I sort of talk about service design to people, they're like maybe feeling threatened or kind of, you know, that's something that feels aspirational. But it's really just about the type of work that you enjoy the most and that you can contribute most to. So we need designers in all of the disciplines and in all of the spaces. Um, it's figuring out like where do you want to work, what kind of work are you good at, and what kind of work do you want to do. Okay, so <laughs> I tried to condense kind of like 10 years of a career into this slide um, and kind of talk you through some of the ups and downs, the kind of highs and lows that I've had. So I also graduated out into a recession. I uh, studied industrial design in Dublin, in Ireland, um, and then I came out into a recession and it was just brutal. I couldn't find work, it was super hard. So when I finally got jobs in UX, I was so excited. I was getting to be a designer, I was learning a lot, that was super awesome. But I still always kind of had this hankering to do service design. Um, and I was always trying to push and like find ways to do that type of work, even when I was working in UX. And so when I finally got there and got a job as a service designer and was doing explicitly framed service design projects, that was super awesome. But after about 10 years of doing this, I really burned out and I was just not feeling super inspired. I kind of reached, I climbed the service design mountain and I was like, oh, <laughs> I got here and I don't even know if this is what I want. Um, so now I'm kind of on the upswing again of trying to figure it out and figure out what's next. And I thought I would share a couple of the things that I did that enabled me to transition from that kind of high of working in UX to the next high of doing service design explicitly. Um, and I wanted to note that my transition was really gradual and it took years. And I would say that it's even still ongoing. It sort of wasn't like I just woke up one day and was like, I'm gonna be a service designer now. Um, and I know that that's a question a lot of people have, like how do I transition? What does that look like? So I'm gonna share a few things that helped me. The first one was really immersing myself in the language and material of service design. So like watching every video I could from every service design conference online, I still do that today. Uh, that's my full archive of Touchpoint, the service design journal. <laughs> Sometimes dry reading, but uh, you know, gotta keep up with what, what people are publishing. Um, and of course, design books that are kind of directly and indirectly related. But really, what this helped to do was build my vocabulary, build my confidence, and give me ideas for the types of things I wanted to try on projects. The second thing which you all know about because you're here tonight was community. Um, and this is what Ryan and Sam and I were talking about as well, like finding great people. So shortly after I moved to Toronto, I started a meetup group called Service Design Toronto. Um, and that has been instrumental in you know, helping me to connect with people, helping people who are interested to kind of build the field together. Um, and it's also been the way that I've found work, uh, clients or jobs throughout the last few years. Uh, so that's been super important. And the last one was finding opportunities to actually practice service design skills and tools and methods um, on my projects. So this was an example of a UX project we were doing um, and we had gone through a discovery phase and I saw an opportunity to try out 
uh, sort of synthesizing and sharing the results in a journey map format. So there was no journey map on the list of deliverables. It was not in the scope. It was not like that was something we were being asked to do. Uh, but I just did it anyway because I wanted practice and I wanted stuff I could show, right? And I think that's another kind of key thing is if you wait for permission to do the kind of work you want or if you wait for your dream project to fall in your lap, you're just going to be waiting for a very, very long time. So a lot of this was about uh, not waiting for permission and just doing it anyway and just practicing. And it meant that when the opportunities did come along, I could point to stuff I had done in the past. So the last thing I wanted to share was lessons learned. Um, and so I only have three lessons from the last 10 years. So <laughs> Ryan and Sam and I were doing pretty good. <laughs> um, all right, so the first one is persevering. Um, and I remember really vividly, and I think about this quite a lot, a conversation that I had with a friend of mine in Dublin. Um, he was an architect, he was older, he was working at Dublin City Council. And uh, we were walking down the street in Dublin, and I was like, you know what? I actually just don't think I'm going to get to do this design thing. Like, I just don't think it's going to happen for me. I don't think I'm going to get to be a designer. I was just having a really hard time finding work. I'd been, like, working for free. I'd taken a job in a call center because I couldn't make any money. Um, and I was just starting to get really disheartened and kind of thinking, like, you know what? This isn't going to happen. And I kind of wanted to mention that you know, it can be easy to look at people who are maybe on stage speaking or who you admire and kind of feel like that, you know, they don't get rejected still. But I do, right? Like, that still happens. I still submit to conferences and don't get in. I still do job interviews and don't go to the second round. And what's really helped is cultivating perseverance and just really, really pushing through even when it's hard. Uh, so I just wanted to share that that's really normal and if you can cultivate that muscle, that's going to really help you. The second one is carving your own path. So I remember when I had moved to Toronto, I was at an event and I was talking to a fairly like senior and important OCAD professor. And I was like, I moved to Toronto, I'm going to be a service designer. And she just looked at me and she was like, what's that? <laughs> and I was like, oh. I've really kind of, you know, misunderstood the, um, the sort of landscape here. My expectations were just way out of line with where people were actually at. Um, and I'll, of course that was a little bit disheartening. But what it meant was I had to find ways to carve my own path, to build the possibility of doing service design type work, even while I was doing UX work and even while I was doing other jobs. So again, finding ways to carve your path into the work you want to do is super important. Um, and there's that Steve Jobs thing about, you know, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And that's very, very true. But if you keep following your gut and you keep doing the type of thing you're interested in and finding opportunities, it will happen. The last one is that we're all figuring it out all the time. So something that I really learned from the experience of kind of burning out and needing to take a step back and reassess was that sometimes even when you reach your goal, like I was like, yes, I have the title of service designer. I am doing service design projects. Like, you know, this is it. And then I realized, like, I still grapple with imposter syndrome. I still wonder if I'm really doing service design, you know? I, I still have all of these things. And so often those destinations are just actually another step on the journey. And we are all just figuring it out as we go along. Even people who, again, seem like they have it all figured out or sort of seem like they, they know how to deal with everything. So I'm really excited to support the next generation of service designers. There is lots of interest. It's so exciting to see communities like this embracing all kinds of design. If the service design bug has bitten you, these are some resources that you can start with. Um, and I encourage you to check out. Um, and I'll pause for, for photos. <laughs> I can tweet this out as well. Um, but that's it. Thank you.